Welcome to How to Have an Intergenerational Conversation, a collaboration between Changing the Narrative and Linkages Connects. Before we start uh, on our content, I would like to invite Diego um, to give us our uh, language justice introduction and explain how we turn on interpretation. Alexa, next slide. Thanks, Rachel. Can you hear me? My audio okay? Yes. Great. So hi everyone, I'll get started with the instructions in English and then I'll repeat them in Spanish. Así que hola a todos y todas. Voy a comenzar dando las instrucciones en inglés y luego las repito en español. So my name is Diego Ponce. I'm here today on behalf of the Community Language Cooperative, the COC. We also have Dan Lasher, the sign language interpreter today. Thank you for having us today at your meeting where the organizers of the meeting made a commitment towards language justice so that people can participate and engage in the language of the heart, meaning the language they feel most comfortable in. We'll use simultaneous interpretation for English and Spanish today. And once I finish saying this in English and after I repeat it in Spanish, we'll start the interpretation at that moment. And once interpretation is on, you'll be able to see that globe icon that says interpretation there in the bottom right hand corner of your computer screen. I'll ask you to please select the globe icon when it appears on the screen and please select your preferred language. And if you're joining today's meeting on your cell phone or your tablet, please be on the lookout for the more button or the three dots button to select your preferred language this other way. So if you're not fully bilingual, strongly encourage you to select your preferred language so you can use interpretation in case anyone were to speak in the opposite language. And if you're bilingual, then just feel free to listen to everyone in the original language. Uh, as always, a special asking I have for the English speaking audience, just please pay attention to the speed in which you're speaking. Spanish is about 20% longer than English. Just please make sure you're speaking at a conversational pace like this and please make sure you don't pick up your reading speed. So thank you so much for that. Uh, buenos días a todos y a todas, o buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Diego Pons. Estoy aquí de parte de la Cooperativa Comunitaria de la Justicia del Lenguaje, el CLC. También con el otro intérprete, Dan Lasher. Uh, muchas gracias por invitarnos hoy a su reunión, donde vamos a comprometernos a servir la justicia del lenguaje. Eso significa que queremos crear un espacio para que todas las personas puedan participar e involucrarse en el idioma su corazón, en el idioma en el que todas las personas se sientan más cómodas. Vamos a utilizar hoy la interpretación simultánea aquí en Zoom, en inglés y en español, para la reunión de hoy. Cuando yo termine de decir esto, se va a activar la interpretación, y ya cuando se activa la interpretación, usted va a poder observar ese icono del globo de la Tierra que era interpretación, allá abajo en la derecha de su pantalla. Por favor, asegúrese de elegir el icono del globo de la Tierra, y por favor, elija su idioma preferido. Pero si usted está asistiendo hoy a la reunión en su celular o en su tableta, por favor, busque las opciones que dicen more, que quiere decir más en inglés, o posiblemente el botón de tres puntos para que pueda seleccionar su idioma preferido de esta otra manera. Si usted no es completamente bilingüe, yo le voy a aconsejar que seleccione su idioma preferido para que pueda utilizar la interpretación cuando alguien está hablando en el otro idioma. Y si usted sí es bilingüe, siéntase libre de escuchar a todos hoy en su idioma original. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Diego, for that introduction. We at both Linkages and Changing the Narrative uh, prioritize accessibility and inclusion. And a piece of that is being able to provide interpretation in, at this point, two languages, but we hope to do more. And as you will see on our slides, we have also uh, translated those into Spanish. Um, closed captioning should also be on. And please, if you have other suggestions for how we can be more inclusive or accessible in the future, we want to hear them. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, Alexa, next slide, please. This is our journey today. Uh, we started with our language justice overview and next we'll be moving into an introduction to our speakers. So I will tell you who I am and our other two speakers. And then we're gonna focus um, on two pieces. One is the why, and that's where we'll be introducing both changing the narrative and linkages connects. And that's the why of intergenerational conversations. Um, we love all of this interest in how do we actually have these conversations. And so that's where the majority of our time is gonna be spent today is focusing on the how. Next slide. So three of us will be taking you through that journey today. The first, um, I am very proud to present um, or to introduce our presenter, Chris Gierken, um, who is the uh, one of the co-directors of Changing the Narrative. Sarah Brindle, who is the other co-director of Changing the Narrative, is also here behind the scenes on this webinar. 
Uh, Chris developed the Age-Friendly Healthcare Initiative and leads the Intergenerational Conversation Campaign for Changing the Narrative. In addition to, and we all wear, wear many hats, uh, being an adjunct instructor at Metropolitan State University of Denver teaching on aging and society. She's a frequent speaker and passionate advocate, as you all will hear, and you've probably heard before, for age inclusivity. Our other speaker, Haley Sanner, who will be taking us through um, the majority of our content today focused on how, uh, also wears multiple hats. Uh, she is the um, Healthy Aging Program Manager at the Colorado Health Network, um, promoting improved quality of life and social connections for older adults aging with HIV. And she's also the co-creator of Collective Healing Through Art, which is a program of Linkages Connects. She has worked in the aging field across the world, developing a deep specialization in social isolation and emotional well-being. And finally, me. I'm Rachel Cohen, also wearing multiple hats. Um, I am the executive director and creator of Linkages Connects, which is an intergenerational initiative and founder and CEO of Aging Dynamics Consulting Firm. Uh, we work nationally to strengthen the capacity of organizations to address diverse challenges of creating and sustaining healthy, age-friendly communities. Come here. Uh, my background is in community planning and social work, and so that's my passion for building communities that are supportive, engaging, and equitable places for people to grow up and grow older. Next slide. I'm gonna hand this off to Chris to get us started on our why and give us a, a, an overview of changing the narrative. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, next slide, please. It's great to be here with everybody. Um, so the, the why to all of this, why intergenerational conversations and why they're so important. So from the work that we do at Changing the Narrative, everything is focused on educating people and raising awareness about ageism and the negative impacts it has on all of us, all ages. And so from that perspective that we have at Changing the Narrative, we view having these conversations with people of all ages focused on ageism and aging and just what it means to be whatever age you're at or have been is a way to help us break down the stereotypes and the myths and the definition of ageism that we use is from the World Health Organization, which is stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination directed towards someone based on age. And when we come together of all different ages and have conversations specifically and deliberately about age and ageism, it reduces our ageist beliefs and um, habits of thought. So it's a great opportunity for us to change the way we understand age if we have any kind of uh, misconceptions about what it means to be of different ages or the age that we're at right now. Um, so these uh, three little pictures show about that it's an opportunity to develop to develop our shared understanding about the harmful effects of ageism on all of us at all ages. It, it, when we talk about ageism, it gets us thinking about what we can do to help reduce it and change our own beliefs if they are leaning in ageist ways. And ultimately, all the work that we do at Changing the Narrative ends with action. We want to and motivate and inspire people to find ways that they can take action in small ways or big ways, whatever fits who you are and what you're doing. But it takes action. We can't just complain that ageism exists. We actually have to do things about it. And so when we have these conversations, that's a really powerful, actionable step that we can take to addressing it. Uh, next slide, please. So, um... so changing the narrative um, started back in 2018. It was founded by Janine Vanderberg. And between 2018 and 2022, we held um, 295 workshops with over 17,000 people from around the world just in those four years. And this year, we're seeing even more momentum. It's really picking up lots more of attention around the world on this topic, which is very encouraging to us because it means this is like the it's it's starting to change and that gives us such great hope. So next slide, please. And um, the work that we do comes from the, the information that came out of a global campaign to combat ageism from the World Health Organization and United Nations back in 2021. And they found in their research that there is specific evidence-based strategies that can help us reduce ageism and their education, intergenerational connections, and policy and law. 
So these that you see on the screen represent work that we have done and do at changing the narrative. And first you'll see ending ages and together. That's different presentations that we do where it's kind of just this overview of what ageism looks like for all of us of different ages. And we do presentations and workshops on that. We have our age-friendly workplace initiative, which is led by Janine Vanderberg about age discrimination in the workplace. Uh, there's age-friendly healthcare, which is the one that I lead, which is taking a look at ageism in healthcare settings. And we also are happy to do customized workshops on what might fit your organization or your group. So reach out anytime and we can talk about that. On the intergenerational side of things, we created a toolkit, which I'll talk more about in depth later. Um, so I won't go into it now. And we did a PBS series in Colorado where we took people from different sectors of all ages and we talked about age, ageism and aging and what that means and from different perspectives, which was really, really exciting. And that's on our website. And we also have worked with different universities on research projects with students. And then the, the policy and law side of it, we've been involved with different organizations to help um, address bills and get bills passed that are about age and age discrimination and ageism. And also the work that we do focuses on strategic communications. And so in these bullets on this slide, you'll see examples of various types of communications that we use to help get our messages out there into the world. And we've had coverage in over 150 media outlets. And you can see all the different bullets here of how we have made an impact. But our mailing list now at this point, email list is over 6,000 people around the world. And it's, it continues to grow. So we think that's pretty exciting. And we, join, we encourage all of you and to share the information about us with your friends and colleagues, because the more we get this information out there, the better and helping to change it. Uh, next slide, please. And another aspect to our work is innovative public campaigns. And these are some examples of some of the ones that we have done. And one is about real photos where we ask people to share photos of people of different ages. And rather than using models or paid, paid people to have these kind of staged photos, we want real photos of real people of different ages. And our birthday card campaign, um, we've had two rounds of that where we commissioned artists to help um, to create age positive birthday cards. Because if you've ever noticed in stores, birthday cards tend to lean toward the negative side of aging and we don't tell us a, a full true story and certainly don't lean positive. And then the last graphic there on the right is um, a crowdsourcing project we did about a year ago. And we asked people what a world without ageism would look like. And an artist created this graphic, which is on our website, and you're all free to share that as well. But these are all examples of convey, conveying messages differently and helping raise awareness about ageism and just talking about it more so we can have a different perspective on age. Um, next slide, please. And the impact that we've had, we've had um, done evaluations and surveys, surveys and these percentages represent different ways we've had an impact. And we know that we're increasing people's knowledge about ageism. People are beginning to feel more equipped to identify and address ageism when they see it. And also increasing people's understanding about what effective messages mean. And it's hard, you know, we know that this work is hard, but we're here in it all together and we're here to support you and just keep having these conversations. So thank you for listening to what Changing the Narrative has been involved with. Next slide. One of the reasons that Linkages Connects was just so excited to be able to collaborate with Changing the Narrative is that is that key overlap um, around addressing uh, ageism. And so Linkages Connects, uh, I'm gonna kind of go through a, a quick overview here on, on just some of the things that we do, but you know, I invite you to, we'll show some resources later and ways to connect with all of us. Um, there's just so much more than what we can cover. Um, Intergenerational connections can look all different ways. Uh, these are just a couple of, of shots from some linkages programs, just showing, um, I think, the, the, the joy and the magic that can come with connecting with people from um, other age groups and the idea that we can do it in so many different ways, but finding ways to connect around things that bring us each joy. 
um, is one way. And I'm going to leave the rest of the how to Haley here um, a little bit later. Alexa, can you go into the next slide? Um, but just wanted to get us get us primed for what we're talking about. The other thing too that we find is really important is to uh, just start with a definition um, because we hear terms like intergenerational and multi-generational used in a variety of different ways. So from our perspective in linkages, we use the definition that was developed by Generations United, um, which talks about a couple of key items. One is having a skipped generation. So um, oftentimes there, there can be different dynamics that, that occur when you've got people in um, generations right next to each other that end up feeling more like a familial dynamic. Not a negative by any means. Those are wonderful dynamics too. Um, we're just talking about when we're creating programs, um, you can often develop and create programs for having skipped generations because there's different kinds of dynamics and different opportunities to connect. And then the other piece I wanna highlight here in the definition is mutually beneficial. And so when we talk about intergenerational connections, it's that mutual benefit. So sometimes we'll hear um, it's an older person, you know, just giving or sharing their wisdom to a younger person or a younger person helping with say technology. When we talk about conversations here, we're talking with that recognition that everybody has something to share regardless of your age. Um, we all bring life experiences um, in really special ways and that's, part of that magic um, that we're gonna talk about how to create today. Next slide. So what is Linkages Connects? Uh, we, are, we are an organization that is committed to addressing social isolation, loneliness and ageism, that's our why. And we do that by creating opportunities for meaningful intergenerational connections. And so that, that means being intentional um, about how we create those connections again, what Haley's gonna talk about later today, um, but really with the recognition that there's so many organizations and individuals like so many of you here who are just eager and hungry for connections. You may be shifting in your life from perhaps a workplace where you just always had people of different ages um, to not having that accessible. And how do you, you know, create those connections and why? And these are the whys. We know and research shows that intergenerational connections has a direct correlation to reducing loneliness and reducing social isolation or avoiding them altogether. And as Chris referenced earlier, ageism, there's no question. Um, and through linkages, next slide. We are seeking to strengthen the field across the world for offering more of these opportunities. So we can say, just put people of different ages in a room and, and you'll have magic. But really, it it takes more than that, and that's um, like the resources we're going to talk about later. But it really there are actual barriers to making this happen, and so linkages was created to be able to address those and just make it so much easier for all of us to create more opportunities, so we can have that big impact. These are the four barriers uh, that have been proven by research. The first. Uh, three uh, are from Generations United and the Eisner Foundation research in 2018. And then linkages, which provides a whole lot of technical assistance to individuals and organizations. Uh, we also do evaluation. And so um, we were also looking for what are the other barriers? One is the design. How do we bring people together? The other is demonstrating that impact. The third is funds that we all know that can stop a program in its tracks and then the collaboration. It's often really difficult to bring um, different entities or different age groups together. We speak different languages, we have different um, goals and different funding opportunities and all of that. It doesn't mean it has to be a barrier, but it can be one. And this is why we created Linkages so that we could just all stop having these barrier moments and just create together. Next slide. And so how we do this, and I will not go through all of these things, um, but Linkages has created a whole resource hub online. We'll give you our website here later, but we're intending to help participants like all of us who want intergenerational connections, organizations who want to create more programs, and also the funders. How do they fund all of us? Um, and so we're doing this in a variety of ways. Um, we have a network that you're able to join and then the whole online hub that we in welcome you to, to explore. 
Next slide. And so as we move into the how, the meat of what we want to talk about today, I want you to get in your mind all the different places that we can create these connections. So I know I referenced programs at one point, and that's just one way, right? That's you know more of a, a formalized way that's been created, but we know that these connections can happen in, in everyday instances. So when you're at the recreation center, perhaps in an exercise class or taking a um, an arts and culture class, at the park, grocery store, at work, like I mentioned before, and at health centers, and so many other places. So I invite you to think about that as we start moving into the how. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Haley to keep us going. Awesome. Um, Chris and Rachel, thanks so much for setting the stage with the why. I'm excited for us to get into the how and how we can make this actionable in our lives. Um, next slide. So to start us off, um, kind of want to brainstorm as a group um, about some different words that we think of when we think of intergenerational connections. Um, and so for those familiar with a word cloud, um, we're going to use that to kind of display uh, what we all think about as um, we think about this type of communication. So Rachel is going to put in the chat a link to the Mentimeter. You can click that link and it will allow you to enter um, a word that comes to mind for you. Um, and we'll share that screen as we kind of get more answers coming. Um, the larger the word, the, lar the larger the amount of people that kind of thought of that word um, at the same time. So to get us started, I can add my word um, right now. So my word would be storytelling. Rachel and Chris, do you have a word that comes to mind to kind of prompt our audience to think about these things? Um. Yeah, my, the word that comes to mind for me is opportunity. And for me, it's hopefulness. I love those. All kind of in that, that collaboration and connection elements. Um, and for those who maybe can't access the Mentimeter, feel free to uh, type any words in the chat as well. So we see some different words coming in. It's bouncing around as people continue to add. But I love that when I'm looking at these different words, I see a mix of, um, kind of the scale of these words. So some of them um, may connect to some of those positive um, things like opportunity, wisdom, connection. And some also highlight that they're not always easy, right? I see challenging in there. Um, I see uh, oh, bouncing around, right? Some other things that were related to um, Kind of transitions, which um, infrequent things that maybe uh, highlight an opportunity for us to grow and things that we can learn. Um, I also love seeing things like authenticity, understanding, um, which really leads us into our how and the things that we want to focus on in our how. Um, so I will let us go back to our slides, but this is a really good way to prompt kind of where we are as a community um, in looking at this type of conversation. So next slide, please. So when I think about a, the how, um, I really wanted to frame it along three pillars. So intersectionality, listening, and practice. And thinking about communication, I've been really inspired by the work of the Othering and Belonging Institute, led by John A. Powell, um, where they highlight that so much of our healthy communication, um, especially when we're kind of interacting along dynamics of othering, like ageism, uh, really rely on us to center belonging. And so the Other and Belonging Institute created a belonging statement. And I want, I want to highlight three of these statements that really mirror the pillars that I want to focus on today. So one says, belonging sees humanity across difference. Belonging is not saming. That is very critical. Um, belonging invites us to develop our skills in deep listening and curiosity. And lastly, belonging is like a garden that benefits from continual relationship, nurture, and work. Um, so next slide, please. So when we talk about intersectionality, uh, this includes all the different pieces that make up who we are, some of which are listed on this slide, but this is not inclusive of everything that could be part of your identity. Um, some of these things may be more visible than others. Some of these things may fluctuate while others may stay consistent throughout our life. Um, and the Other Name Belonging Institute has really coined this term of bridging versus breaking. 
So breaking is when we see these pieces of our identity as ways to kind of separate each other um, and see us as us versus them. So in an age situation, we're talking about ageism, that us versus them of different generations. Um, and this can increase isolation, harden systems of oppression, and as Christian Rachel Bose mentioned, right, have those negative um, health effects. Next slide, please. Bridging, on the other hand, um, is when we kind of move from that us versus them into the more inclusive, like, we. Um, and it allows us to bring an awareness to our multiple intersecting identities um, as our many ways of belonging. So ultimately giving us more opportunities to find belonging um, rather than opportunities to other. Um, and as you can see, research has shown that belonging has shown improvement to our health, both emotionally and physically, um, in terms of stress responses, as well as um, healthy, uh, healthy attitudes and healthy um, bodily impacts. So again, I really wanna emphasize that we aren't saming, we aren't abandoning our identities, but instead of creating a healthy dialogue to see each other's humanity. Um, and throughout this, we wanna recognize that when we're in conversation with others, um, that safety should be prioritized. Um, and it's always important to recognize when oppressive systems are entering our conversations in ways that threaten our safety. Um, and so that's something to be aware of and something that we're continue, going to continue to discuss throughout this next section. Um, also kind of a relevant dialogue that we'll probably share, but there was actually a New York Times article that talked about how having these kind of healthy dialogues, especially when they may be a tough conversation, um, can have that positive impact on our health as well. So really emphasizing that that doesn't mean kind of not upholding authenticity or not upholding your values um, when we're bridging. Um, but being able to enter these things with curiosity um, and that kind of bridging perspective. Um, next slide, please. So just to get us started and feel free throughout this to add your thoughts in the chat. Um, Chris and Rachel will kind of help me share some of those or if there's any questions that come up. Um, but thinking about this aspect of bridging, some of us may be more familiar with that term than others. But are there relationships or situations that you already use bridging in? Um, and then maybe are there other kind of situations where a bridging mindset could be very helpful? I know for myself, um, I find that I bring this kind of perspective easiest when I'm working as a facilitator in an intergenerational setting. A lot of times I use the word that I am a bridge kind of between the two participants um, where I can use my different communication skills to kind of highlight the things that I know about each person or what someone has said um, to kind of create that bridging opportunity between participants. Um, that may not always be as easy when I'm in my, my own family or friendship settings um, where I'm not wearing a facil facilitator hat. We have a couple um, people that wrote into the chat, if you'd like to hear. Um, uh, Sandy Z shared that she's been exploring pop culture as a potential gateway. That's interesting. I love that. Uh, it kind of reminds me too, another one, when Rachel was talking about different settings, right? Some of these may be very deep settings. Sometimes it can be at the grocery store or when we're out and about. And one that I like to use um, is things about maybe fashion or style. I think a lot of our personality can show up in kind of what we wear and how we wear it. And uh, making comments on that has um, always kind of opened doors for me. Maybe it opens the story behind the artist that made your earrings. Um, and I think that adds to a lot deeper levels of communications and can show the values um, that we portray and the way we present ourselves. Um, next slide, please. So now when we have that kind of framework and mindset of bridging, I want to kind of talk about how we can enact this through using reflective listening skills. Um, so those who may have familiarity with things like motivational interviewing, you'll recognize some of these elements as kind of important ways that we can work with others um, and kind of show that that through our communication. Um, so communication is always a two way street, right? It takes both parties to engage in this. So all of these dynamics um, are important for us to recognize for ourselves, as well as in those who we're trying to communicate with. Um, and kind of some of these bridges may be longer than others. Some may be very easy to make and some may take a lot more time. Um, and so especially when we're working through long bridges, uh, it may 
us to kind of work harder to uphold some of these practices and be able to take kind of breaks along the way. Um, so first off is recognizing that some conversations may cause us to have kind of heightened responses, um, especially if we are starting to feel unsafe. Um, and this can show up in our body. Sometimes that shows up as tensing. Sometimes you may kind of have a little shake. Sometimes your heart may kind of pound a little bit louder. Um, and so recognizing what does that look like for you and recognizing, are you still safe in that setting? Um, or is that something you need to leave immediately? Or is it a moment for you to kind of practice calming your body to continue to engage in this challenging conversation, um, especially if it is kind of heightening your body in that way? Um, and so a calm body can really help us maintain that bridging perspective and being aware of that, not only for ourselves, but for the other person we're engaging with. So if we see that person we're engaging with start to have some of those physical responses, what can kind of we do to help mirror that? Um, and I love that the next aspect of like right, looking in a mirror and it kind of goes both ways, not only with kind of what we're saying, but also our body. Um, that if we are modeling a calm body, that can help the other person that we're communicating with maintain a calmer body and maintain that feeling of, of safety in our body um, and maintain that feeling of being present in the space. Um, and so when we think about reflecting back our answers, this can be a great way for us to center back on listening. Um, where if, again, if you're familiar with motivational interviewing, uh, this skill kind of asks us to repeat what we heard before we add our own thoughts. Um, so it allows us to kind of take a moment to not just be thinking about what our response is, but really hear what someone says, re reflect it back to them to show them that they feel heard and valued in that situation. Um, kind of next is our kind of tones, which again goes with that like body heightening where tough conversations can sometimes get elevated. Um, and we're not trying to tone police, but we want to recognize um, that when a tone of either ourselves or the other person is getting in the way of our ability to listen. So if we're getting to a point where maybe we're both shouting at each other, are we really still listening to each other? Um, and maybe we're talking past each other and not using some of those skills like reflecting answers back um, when tones get tightened. So it can just be a cue. That's not always true. For some people, tone may be how you present yourself and being loud and passionate um, isn't impacting your listening skills, but for others it may. So it's something to be aware of. Um, and lastly, I want to think about how we ask questions. If we're asking yes or no questions, we can close off conversations. Um, and so open-ended questions can incite more and when we continue to ask follow-up questions, that can incite more things that can be helpful. Um, especially when we're looking to find more points of connections and working through a disagreement, coming from a place of curiosity can really help us move into that space. So kind of using that in combination with the reflection, maybe I heard you say this, what do you mean by that? Rather than kind of jumping to a point of disagreement, but asking for clarification can help us kind of enter that conversation from a bridging perspective. Um, can we move to the next slide? So I really love this uh, kind of infographic that Beam created, um, which can be a really great reminder for us to uphold a lot of these practices of both intersectionality and reflective listening, especially when we're getting into tough conversations. So that pause, right, pause in our body and in our mind and our response, um, but paying attention to their, their body thoughts and feelings, assessing what's activating you and how that shows up for you, understanding where the roots of your feelings are coming from, setting boundaries um, to ensure your safety, and then empathizing with those involved. Um, so going into the next part, in that way to kind of uphold our boundaries or especially when we are maybe in tougher conversations um, or we recognize when the ability to listen either for ourselves or for others has become diminished, uh, boundaries can be a really helpful way for us to remove ourselves maybe from that conversation at a time and come back if it's a conversation we can still safely engage in um, when we feel like the listening capacity is better. 
Um, so I love that this really centers us on um, our values and identifying our need and then identifying an action that can really relate to that need. So it becomes very tangible and becomes something that centers that bridging, right? When we center a value um, that may be shared with another person, it can highlight that aspect of bridging. Um, Rachel, would you like to share kind of an example of what this could look like? Sure. So I, I really value curiosity and learning about other people's um, identities and life experiences and sharing my own. And I need to feel safe and not judged on both what I share and how I ask questions and want to offer that to the other person I'm talking to. So to make that happen, um, I like to suggest that we give each other grace for not using the right words and gently correct or offer su suggestions to the other person or alternatives. Wonderful. I love that kind of that example of calling in versus calling out for those familiar in that, with that term, especially when that bridging may be a little bit longer, um, that that can be a really good opportunity to teach each other um, and learn from each other in those moments. Um, next slide, please. So kind of as we're reflecting on this, I wanted to prompt us to kind of identify things that facilitate deep listening for ourselves and things that may be barriers to deep listening. Um, so feel free to add any of your thoughts in the chat um, about things that maybe help you show up um, to listen deeply. Maybe there are specific relationships or situations that you can do so most easily. And kind of what helps you prepare to listen deeply. Um, so I know for me that sometimes, like I mentioned, when we're when I'm in, at work, it may be easier for me to naturally utilize these skills. Um, but maybe when I'm in closer relationships, it can be harder to remember to practice these skills because I'm not wearing that facilitator hat. Um, the other times, like maybe when I'm stressed or consumed with other topics, that these can be barriers um, that kind of prevent me from being able to listen as well. Um, I've also utilized kind of different forms of communication to help me practice these elements of listening in isolation rather than having to do all of them. So for example, if I'm writing back via email or text, I can take a lot more time to respond to something and really use intentional language, really kind of foster that curiosity um, and that reflective listening in the way that I'm writing. But it, I don't have to worry about kind of how my body language is happening or my tone or things like that that may have been heightened, especially if I didn't agree with the response. Um, same thing over the phone. I may still have to work on tone and verbiage, but I don't always have to focus on body language. And so I can practice two of those things at the same time for then when I'm in the moment um, in person where I can have to work on all of those things at once. Wonderful. And so lastly, focusing on how we question, how we ask questions. Um, so a lot of times we get asked questions like, how's it going? Or what's up? Um, and those are very kind of vague questions that we don't always know how to enter into. Um, sometimes we may have kind of canned responses to that. And sometimes we may have to try to think about um, ways to add detail and continue a conversation beyond just I'm good. Um, so an example of this, uh, a lot of times when you go on a trip, people are like, how was your trip? Um, something that I have switched for myself is to ask people, what was your favorite meal? Um, because that type of questioning inspires someone to say a little bit more detail, inspires them to give a context of the scenario, describe the meal, and then allows us to continue to have follow-up questions rather just than just saying, it was really great. I loved everything we saw. Because where do you enter in on a maybe a week long trip, a lot of things happened and it can be hard for the respondent to decide what am I going to share right then? So more specific questions can give us more insight to that. Um, Rachel or Chris, do either of you have a question you really like to ask? Um, I, I've got, I got a suggestion for people. Um, one that I think gets people thinking is to ask someone, what was your maybe favorite moment or memory in elementary school? 
something positive that happened. Love that. Wonderful. So something that to kind of consider is that that third pillar is practice. Um, I really like to remind people that this is a, these are states, not traits, meaning we are not born with them and they continue to take practice. Um, and as we may transition to different points in our life, we may have to repractice and relearn some of these skills. We may have to unlearn skills that we were using before in different situations that may not apply in new situations. Um, and so giving ourselves ourselves grace as well as other people grace. Um, a lot of times when I hear people say, oh, someone was really, really grumpy or whatnot. When we know that isolation um, is impacting so many of us, especially after things like COVID, um, that we have to think about it in a little bit different way. If someone hasn't been practicing having conversations and having to ask these types of questions, um, they may come off in a little bit different way, maybe a little terser than they would if they were really well practiced um, and hadn't been isolated. And just knowing all of the intersections of isolation and emotional well being, um, that we want to be aware of that and give each other grace and remind ourselves that we have to practice these things. And sometimes that means practicing by yourselves in the mirror. Sometimes it means talking to yourself kind of in your journal or writing down kind of what you want to say ahead of time before going into conversations. Um, and other times it can be practicing in the moment and giving yourself grace even when we don't do it perfectly. Um, so kind of going forward in, uh, kind of in your life, taking away kind of what you've learned in this setting, I'd like to, to kind of discuss what would be some skills that you would like to practice. Maybe there's a specific relationship or situation that you like to practice in. That could be something a relationship that maybe you feel very comfortable in. I know I have some friends who really enjoy brainstorming. How would I go into this tougher conversation? Can we kind of role play this and practice this out so I feel prepared in that tougher conversation with someone that maybe I don't know as well or someone that we may disagree on certain things? Um, and then in, in that kind of vein, who would support you? What, what do you need to support this? Is it kind of getting you a list of different questions, um, of different examples of beautiful questions. So you feel prepared with like the ones that are in your back pocket when conversation stalls. Um, or is it that kind of role playing element of, do you have that person in your life? Um, so here, I just wanna share a bit about the work that we've done at Changing the Narrative and the toolkit that we created for intergenerational conversations. And back in 2019, we first created on the same page and it's a downloadable toolkit on our website. And that came about just with our interest in bringing people of all ages together because we knew that people of all ages experience ageism in different ways and coming together will help to us to mitigate that. And um, since 2019, we have um, developed, revised a new one, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but initially this was a capstone project that I did when I was a student at MSU Denver, getting my master's in health administration. And this ended up taking off. We didn't realize it was gonna be so popular when we launched it in 2019, but it ended up reaching people. Oh, next slide, please. Um, across the country and in 20, I think 23 different countries outside of us. So that was four years ago, which we were really excited and encouraged about because it told us that people have an interest in coming together of all ages and having these conversations that are so crucial to helping us toward ending ageism. Uh, next slide, please. And then in September, we relaunched it. We revised the toolkit and just relaunched it this year. And um, so it's free to all of you to download from our website and highly encourage you all to check it out. Uh, next slide, please. And since this year, we have reached people in all 50 states and I think it's like 63 countries now and all continents. So it's definitely the awareness is raising about ageism and with all kinds of campaigns that are out there like ours and many other great ones. So this is an important conversation for all of us to start having. Next slide, please. 
And this is just an example of part of what's in our toolkit are different links to some short videos on ageism. We also have uh, several different categories of questions within the toolkit and you're free to modify the toolkit to fit your groups and the needs and the types of things you wanna talk about. But um, we have different categories like um, isolation and loneliness and stereotyping and assumptions. So make it your own, take the toolkit and make it work for the groups that you're connected with and use it in the ways. And we'd love to hear about what you're doing with it. So feel free to reach out to us as well. Next slide. So as, as we sort of uh, previewed at the beginning, there's a lot of resources and we know that there's even more beyond this. Um, there's so many wonderful efforts, uh, you know, around the world. And, and many of you here in the chat uh, have been sharing some of what you're doing too. So it, it that's part of what makes me hopeful too, um, is that uh, there's just so much we can do together. Um, linkages is, is adding uh, to, to those resources as well. And you can find on our website, um, we've we've got at least we have four toolkits so far um, that are up here. These are three of them. Our version of a toolkit is more of a, it's a program concept. So we don't believe in the program in a box. We know that all of our communities are different um, in really beautiful ways. And so we offer up a program idea. So one of them is a, a music sharing program. There's another that's focused around storytelling through photography. And a third, the Journeys Toolkit, um, encompasses a lot of different types of arts practices um, and is designed to engage different age groups intentionally brought together to share their life journeys, both current and looking to the future. Um, you can find all of these on our website um, and a whole lot of other resources. Um, next slide. And then we also, as we had referenced at the beginning, there's four common barriers. We are all experiencing one of those four or all of those four. And so one way that we have found to help each other is by connecting. And so we're talking today about connecting individuals, but we also connect organizations. And so if you're from an organization or, or an individual who wants to create an intergenerational program, the network is for you. Um, we meet quarterly and it's an opportunity to learn together. So we learn about designing programs and evaluating them and finding funding and how to collaborate, how to get around the four barriers. And we also connect with each other because that's where we can support each other. Um, we're not in competition here. We're all just trying to create a lot more intergenerational conversations. So on this next slide, uh, I can go to the next one, Alexa. Um, we give you some information on how to sign up. The next meeting is January 25th, and we'll be focusing um, on collaboration and hearing from the Grandmothers Collective that's based out of Boston um, and is working internationally. And so we, we invite you to join us um, next slide. And after, after this, as we send out the slides, we're also going to be sending out all of these resources and more, um, so you don't need to jot things down too quickly. But Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to type them into the chat, we could address those now. I don't know if there was anything specific yet brought up, but I think one person asked actually for some examples, if you have any, Haley, um, on engaging ideas for like, especially in the workplace on the typical, like, hi, how are you? Or, you know, just kind of the standard workplace communication of just how are you doing? What's going on? Do you have any other little Absolutely. tips? Absolutely. Um, kind of added some things. I think uh, like Rachel and I both wrote something around what's bringing you joy or what's made you happy this week, or um, especially maybe if it's in a workplace setting, um, maybe like what's a small win of the week. So some things that can, questions that can both um, kind of decrease, maybe burnout in a workplace um, and also increase kind of connection and a share of like celebratory moments in the workplace. Excellent, excellent tips. Thank you. Um, Oliver, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, one thing that definitely really helped get the attention going and I've been doing this for the last few months is protesting on the streets like say no to ageism and the theme that I have came up with is hashtag I look my age and another theme I've been doing to raise awareness about ageism is called empowered at 50 plus so we've been doing it on the streets and in the beginning where we were campaigning on the street lots of people were ignoring it and not looking at the signs but if you do it a few times a lot of people started to get interested 
but only with a few people. But then I think the more times you do the same thing, more people will come and join. So you might expect if you did the protesting on the street, you only get nobody coming for the first time. And then the next time you get maybe one or two, then you get 10 and you get hundreds and then you get a thousand. So, yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, those are great tips just to kind of the public uh, help or public perspective, right? Public messaging. Um, there's one other question, Haley, um, that's asking, what advice do you have when tough political comments may come up at holiday dinners? Any yeah, comments? absolutely. I mean, I think that's where those um, kind of four elements of reflective listening can come in. Um, so really taking a moment to kind of calm your body because a lot of times when those things happen we may get really heightened um, because we're really passionate um, about those those views and those values and someone may have a sound uh, seemingly attacked them um, I love that someone brought up the kind of using and instead of but um, and so kind of bringing in that both and if there are situations where a both and perspective may be helpful um, and thinking about highlighting the value so maybe like like Rachel was saying, I heard you say that you really value being with others. What about whatever that comment may be? Um, then asking that point of curiosity, what did you mean by this? Rather than kind of going at it to just trying to butt heads um, because we may disagree, is trying to get a little deeper about why someone thinks that way to see if there are values that can align and there can be moments for shared learning um, and that we may be able to change, not necessarily going to, with it changing someone's mind, um, though we can if we are kind of connecting on those values um, rather than just trying to um, kind of butt heads. Yeah, I, I like that you just brought that up because one of the things that I am conscious of often is to not have the intention to change someone's mind because no one can necessarily just change anyone because you want them to change, right? And so it's about giving them space to share and feel comfortable to share and just hearing another perspective. How do you prevent discussing ageism um, from becoming a political conversation? There are generational divides due to assumptions. Um, and I think, again, some of that reflecting back of values rather than kind of leaning on that us versus them or that division of, of generations, but recognizing I hear you value this and I also value that or um, like that value may have changed. I wonder what context are um, kind of changing that value, like what different things maybe are coming up again, coming from that curiosity point. Um, and yeah, someone asks like what asking what ageism means when someone brings up a word um, that could be othering or a situation that could be othering, asking what someone means um, to see if there's a point of, of bridging. I'm going to throw out one other quick thing that was in the chat um, that, that uh, Christine Foster brought up, which is also about the importance of the built environment um, to create those spaces for intergenerational conversations. And in particular, um, she referenced trauma-informed design. So we talk about trauma-informed principles and, and Haley you know, discussed a lot of that today. Um, in terms of our, our communication, there's also our spaces and how we make those welcoming and, and friendly and safe places as well, too. So I think that's that's worthy of a whole other conversation, too, is how our built environment um, encourages also what we're talking about today. Great. And I also see one more that I think will go into the some of the resources on the next slide, too. Um, about kind of questions that we can ask on the phone um, and suggestions for potential friendly caller programs. Um, we're gonna share some of those resources uh, in the follow-up, things like time slips, which is has a whole list of beautiful questions really focusing on working with those living with dementia um, to kind of center those things. Things like StoryCorps um, can be a really great way to conduct oral histories in settings you're in. Maybe it's with your family or um, in relationships such that someone can come kind of prepared with questions, they can guide you on how to make these questions and then record it and create this um, kind of thing, lasting memory. Um, I already mentioned Othering and Belonging Institute and some of the ways that they can, you can use some of those skills to have some of those tough conversations. Um, and then lastly, I really like to use some of these different card decks, um, which can be kind of 
a, a way to bring in a game element um, to having conversations uh, with people in your life where you can come up with or use these cards to ask these conversations, to dig a little deeper, to kind of get some different ideas um, when you're having conversations, whether in person or over the phone um, and kind of build some deeper relationships. Next slide, I think. Oh, and we just wanted to also let everyone know um, that we'll be sending out a survey link and on that, we really want to know within it, um, one of the questions would be about your interest in a more extensive session or workshop and what your interest there would be. And um, just let us know what would work for all of you, what are, what's needed out there, what can we do to help to fill that gap. And you'll be getting a follow-up email with all of um, with a recording of today's session and all of the information and links to all of these different resources. So please stay in touch with us. And we would love to hear from you and what's needed out there in, in the work that you're all doing. And Rachel and Haley, did you have anything else you wanted to add or think? I'll just add a quick thank you. Uh, we just had such amazing, wonderful response um, to the registration for this. And uh, we hope you'll respond to that survey because we'd love to meet up with you guys again and go even deeper um, on all of this. So thank you all for your time and keep an eye out for our, our follow-up email. <laughs>